Okay, ladies. Oh, got to turn on the microphone. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, here we are in chapter five of the history of the universe by Louis Ginsburg, or edited by Louis Ginsburg, passed down to us from antiquity. Uh, this is the reading cow from another world, and uh, I'm on the Sansar platform. So today, uh, Sansar has been telling me that my DirectX 11 device has been removed and shutting down. Uh, it's an old bug, but uh, I think it's going to keep happening because I don't have DirectX 11. I've got DirectX 12. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next thrilling, exciting episode of the Reading Cow from Another World uh, thing that this is. Continuing Chapter 5 of the Legends of the Jews, uh, uh, the great patriarch Abraham. Okay, so at the expiration of two years, it happened that Nimrod dreamed a dream. Remember Nimrod with the fiery furnace? That guy. In his dream, he found himself with his army near the fiery furnace in the valley into which Abraham had been cast. A man resembling Abraham stepped out of the furnace, and he ran after the king with a drawn sword, the king fleeing before him in terror. While running, the pursuer threw an egg at Nimrod's head. You remember that Beastie Boys song, The Eggman? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> ah, I digress. And a mighty stream issued therefrom, uh, wherein the king's whole host was drowned. So this egg, like the whole, like uh, a mighty stream came out of it and drowned the entire army of Nimrod. Okay, the king alone survived with three men. When Nimrod examined his companions, he observed that they wore royal attire, and in form and stature they resembled himself. The stream changed back into an egg again, and a little chick broke forth from it, and it flew up and settled upon the head of the king, and put out one of his eyes. Ouch! The king was confounded in his sleep, and when he awoke, his heart beat like a trip hammer, and his fear was exceeding great. In the morning, when he arose, he sent and called for his wise men and his magicians, and told them his dream. One of his wise men, Anoko by name, stood up and said, No, O king, this dream points to the misfortune which Abraham and his descendants will bring upon thee. A time will come when he and his followers <clears throat> will make war upon thy army, and they will annihilate it. Thou and the three kings, thy allies, will be the only ones to escape death. But the later thou wilt lose thy life at the hands of one of the descendants of Abraham. Consider, O king, that thy wise men read this fate of thine in the stars fifty-two years ago at the birth of Abraham. As long as Abraham liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Nimrod took Anoko's words to heart and dispatched some of his servants to seize Abraham and kill him. It happened that Eliezer, the slave whom Abraham had received as a present from Nimrod, was at that pre uh, was at that time at the royal court. With great haste, he sped to Abraham to induce him to flee before the king's bailiffs. His master accepted his advice and took refuge in the house of Noah and Shem, where he lay hiding a whole month. The king's officers reported that despite zealous efforts, Abraham was nowhere to be found. Thenceforth, the king did not concern himself about Abraham. Well, out of sight, out of mind. That's what they say. When Terah visited his son in his hiding place, Abraham proposed that they leave the land and take up their abode in Canaan. 
in order to escape the pursuit of Nimrod. He said, consider that it was not to escape, uh, consider that it was not for thy sake that Nimrod overloaded thee with honors, but for his own profit. Though he continued to confer the greatest of benefactions upon thee, what are they but earthly vanity? For riches and possessions profit not in the day of wrath and fury. Hearken unto my voice, O my father. Let us depart for the land of Canaan and serve the God that hath created thee, that it may be well with thee. Noah and Shem aided and abetted the efforts of Abraham to persuade Terah, whereupon Terah consented to leave his country, and he and Abraham and Lot. The son of Haran departed for Haran with their households. They found the land pleasant, and also the inhabitants thereof, who readily yielded to the influence of Abraham's humane spirit and his piety. Many of them obeyed his precepts and became God-fearing and good. Terah's resolved to quit his native land for the sake of Abraham and take up his abode in strange parts, and his impulse to do it before even the divine call visited Abraham himself. This the Lord accounted a great merit under, unto Terah, and he was permitted to see his son Abraham rule as king over the whole world. For when the miracle happened and Isaac was born unto his aged parents, the whole world, the whole world, folks, repaired to Abraham and Sarah and demanded to know what they had done that so great a thing should be accomplished for them. Abraham told them, uh, listen, whole world. Um, Abraham told them all that had happened between Nimrod and himself how he had been ready to be burnt for the glory of God, and how the Lord had rescued him from the flames. In token of their admiration for Abraham and his teachings, they appointed him to be their king, and in commemoration of Isaac's wondrous birth, the money coined by Abraham bore the figures of an aged husband and wife on the obverse side, and of a young man and his wife on the reverse side. For Abraham and Sarah both were rejuvenated at the birth of Isaac. Abraham's white hair turned black, and the lines in Sarah's face were smoothed out. For many years, Terah continued to live a witness of his son's glory, for his death did not occur until Isaac was a youth of thirty-five, and, still, and a still greater reward waited upon his good deed. God accepted his repentance, and when he departed this life, he entered into paradise and not into hell. Though he had passed the larger number of his days in sin, indeed, it had been his fault that Abraham came near losing his life at the hands of Nimrod. The Star in the East, the next segment. Are you ready on the edge of your seats? I know you can't wait. Okay. Terah had been a high official at the court of Nimrod, and he was held in great consideration by the gang and his suite. A son was born unto him, whom he called Abram, because the king had raised him to an exalted place. In the night of Abraham's birth, the astrologers and the wise men of Nimrod came to the house of Terah, and ate and drank and rejoiced with him that night. When they left the house, they lifted up their eyes toward heaven to look at the stars. And they saw, and behold, one great star came from the east and ran athwart the heavens and swallowed up the four stars at the four corners. It was an astrological phenomenon. They all were astonished at the sight. But they understood this matter and knew its import. They said to one another, This only betokens that the child that hath been born unto Terah this night will grow up and be fruitful, and he will multiply and possess all the earth, he and his children forever, and he and his seed will slay great kings and inherit their lands. 
They went home that night, and in the morning they rose up early and assembled in their meeting house. They spake and said to one another, Lo, the sight that we saw last night is hidden from the king. It has not been made known to him. And should this thing become known to him in the latter days, he will say to us, Why did you conceal this matter from me? And then we shall all suffer death. Now let us go and tell the king the sight which we saw, and the interpretation thereof, and we shall be clear from this thing. And they went to the king, and told him the sight they had seen, and their interpretation thereof. And they added the advice that he pay the value of the child to Terah, and slay the babe. Accordingly, the king sent for Terah, and when he came, he spake to him, It had been told me, it, be, it, hath, it hath been told unto me, that a son was born to thee yesternight, and a wondrous sign was observed in the heavens at his birth. Now give me the boy, that we may slay him before evil comes upon us from him, and I will give thee thy house full of silver and gold in exchange for him. Terah answered, This thing which thou promisest unto me is like the words which a man spoke to a mule, saying, I will give thee a great heap of barley, a houseful thereof, on condition that I cut off thy head. The mule replied, Of what use will all the barley be to me if thou cuttest off my head? Who will eat it when thou givest it to me? Thus also do I say, What sh shall I do with silver and gold after the death of my own son? Who shall inherit me? But when Terah saw how the king's anger burned within him at these words, he added, Whatever the king desireth to do unto his servant, that let him do. Even my son is at the king's disposal, without value or exchange. He and his two older brethren. Think about it. The king spake, however, saying, I will purchase thy youngest son for a price. And Torah made answer, Let my king give me three days' time to consider the matter and consult about it with my family. The king agreed to this condition, and on the third day he went to sent to Terah, saying, Give me thy son for a price, as I spoke unto thee, and if thou wilt not do this, I will send and slay all thou hast in thy house. There shall not be a dog left unto thee. Then Terah took a child, which is handmaid, had born unto him that that day, and he brought the babe to the king and received value for him. And the king took the child and dashed his head against the ground, for he thought it was Abraham. But Terah took his son Abraham together with the child's mother and his nurse and concealed them in a cave. And thither he carried provisions to them once a month. And the Lord was with Abraham in the cave, and he grew up, and the king and all his servants thought Abraham was dead. And when Abraham was ten years old, he and his mother and his nurse went out from the cave. For the king and his servants had forgotten the affair of Abraham. They forgot it, right? They forgot it. In that time, all the inhabitants of the earth, with the exception of Noah and his household, transgressed against the Lord. And they made unto themselves every man his God, gods of wood and stone, which could neither speak nor hear nor deliver from distress. The king and all his servants and Terah with his household were the first to worship images of wood and stone. Terah made twelve gods of large size, of wood and of stone, corresponding to the twelve months of the year. And he paid homage to them monthly in turn the true believer are you ready once abraham went into the temple of the idols in his father's house to bring sacrifices to them and he found one of them marumath by name hewn out of stone lying prostrate on his face before the iron god of nahor the idol was too heavy for him to raise it alone and he called his father to help him put marumath back in his place while they were handling the image, its head dropped off, and Terah took a stone and chiseled another Merimath, setting the head of the first upon the new body. Then Terah continued and made five more gods, and all these he delivered unto Abraham, and bade him sell them in the streets of the city. 
Abraham saddled his mule and went to the inn where the merchants from Fandana in Syria put up on their way to Egypt. He hoped to dispose of his wares there. When he reached the inn, one of the camels belonging to the merchants belched, and the sound frightened his mule so that it ran off pell-mell and broke three of the idols. The merchants not only bought the two sound idols from him, they also gave him the price of the broken ones, for Abraham had told them how distressed he was to appear before his father with less money than he had expected to receive for his handiwork. This incident made Abraham reflect upon the worthlessness of idols, and he said to himself, What are these evil things done by my father? Is not he the god of his gods? For do they not come into being by reason of his carving and chiseling and contriving? Were it not more seemly that they should pay worship to him than he to them, saying they are the work of his hands? Meditating thus, he reached his father's house, and he entered and handed his father the money for the five images. And Terah rejoiced, Rejoice! And said, Blessed art thou unto my gods, because thou didst bring me the price of the idols, and my labor was not in vain. But Abraham made reply, Hear, my father Terah, blessed are thy gods through thee, for thou art their god, since thou didst fashion them, and their blessing is destruction, and their help is vanity. They that help not themselves, how can they help thee or bless me? Terah grew very wrathful at Abraham, that he uttered such speech against his gods. And Abraham, thinking upon his father's anger, left him and went from the house. But Terah called him back and said, Gather together the chips of the oak wood from which I made images before thou didst return and prepare my dinner for me. Abraham made ready to do his father's bidding, and as he took up the chips, he found a little god among them, whose forehead bore the inscription of God Barisat. He threw the chips upon the fire and set Barisat up next to it, saying, Attention, take care, Barisat, that the fire... Go not out until I come back. If it burns low, blow into it and make it flame up again. Speaking thus, he went out. When he came in again, he found Barisat lying prone upon his back, badly burnt. Smiling, he said to himself, In truth, Barisat, thou canst keep the fire alive and prepare food. And while he spoke, the idol was consumed to ashes. Then he took the dishes to his father, and he ate and drank and was glad and blessed his god Merumath. But Abraham said to his father, Bless not thy god Merumath, but rather thy god Barisat, for it was he, for he it was, who out of his great love for thee threw himself into the fire that thy meal might be cooked. Where is he now? exclaimed Terah. And Abraham answered, He hath become ashes in the fierceness of the fire. Terah said, Great is the power of Barisat. I will make me another this day, and tomorrow he will prepare my food for me. These words of his father made Abraham laugh in his mind, but his soul was grieved at his obduracy, and he proceeded to make clear his views upon the idols, saying, Father, no matter which of the two idols thou blessest, thy behavior is senseless, for the images that stand in the holy temple are more to be worshipped than thine. Zucchaeus, the god of my brother Nahor, is more venerable than Merumath, because he is made cunningly of gold. When he grows old, he will be worked over again. But when thy Merumath becomes dim, or is shivered in pieces, he will not be renewed, for he is of stone. And the god Joauva, who stands above the other gods with Zucchaeus, is more venerable than Barisat, made of wood, because he is hammered out of silver and ornamented by men to show his magnificence. But thy Barisat, before thou didst fashion him into a god with thy axe, was rooted into the earth, standing there great and wonderful with the glory of branches and blossoms. Now he is dry and gone as his sap. From his height he has fallen to the earth. From grandeur he came to pettiness, and the appearance of his face has paled away, and he himself was burnt in the fire, and he was consumed unto ashes. He is no more. And thou didst then say, I will make me another this day, and tomorrow he will prepare my food for me. Father, 
Abraham continued and said, The fire is more to be worshipped than thy gods of gold and silver and wood and stone, because it consumes them. But also the fire I call not God, because it is subject to the water, which quenches it. But also the water I call not God, because it is sucked up by the earth. And I, I call the earth more venerable because it conquers the water. But also the earth I call not God because it is dried out by the sun. And I call the sun more venerable than the earth because he illumines the whole world with his rays. But also the sun I call not God because his light is obscured when darkness cometh up. Nor do I call the moon and the stars gods because their light too is extinguished when their time to shine is past. But hearken unto this, my father Terah, which I will declare unto thee, the God who hath created all things, he is the true God. He hath empurpled the heavens and gilded the sun and given radiance to the moon and also the stars. And he drieth out the earth in the midst of many waters. And also uh, thee hath he put upon the earth and me hath he sought out in the in the confusion of my thoughts. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the next uh, secondary tertiary uh, part three of chapter five of the episode of the uh, Legends of the Jews edited by Louis Ginsberg, uh, read to you by the Reading Cow from Another World with Bedtime Stories thing that this is. Join us again next time as we continue with the next thrilling chapter of the section of the episode of the next part of uh, chapter 5 of the Legends of the Jews, the Iconoclast. Until then, uh, goodbye.